Hi guys, <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> I actually do have a life outside of this little tiny cubicle and Johnny Cash's arse poking at me. Um, but here we are again, and thank you for joining me, James Dean. Howdy, James. Steven Sicord, uh, Deb De Bruyne, hello from Ottawa. Um, thanks for joining me. Um, I was playing a little bit of a, an instrumental piece, which was uh, actually the first part is The Friendly Giant. Those of you of a certain vintage may remember The Friendly Giant. Um, it's a great CBC TV uh, show, kids show, um, and it was notable because it was shot live all the time. And so everything about it, including the intro music, was live. And there was this harpist who played the intro theme for the Friendly Giant. <laughs> played it on a harp live every single show and made so much money because you get paid cartage when you're a union musician. And that's a little fee to allow you to bring your instrument back and forth to the studio. And this dude made so much money just on the cartridge alone that he bought a second harp and left it at the CBC studio so that he had his, his work harp and his home harp. Um, that's how popular the Friendly Giant was. Anyway, it was one of my childhood uh, tune, uh, shows, favorite shows. So I learned how to play it on the guitar as part of another instrumental piece. And the reason I was playing it, because I wanted you to hear something when you were, you know, logging in. Um, but I also wanted you to hear it because it's in a, a tuning, which today's Under the Hood song is in this tuning. And that is a dadgad tuning. And the dadgad tuning, I will continue with the format as we've been doing it, which is to play the song, et cetera, et cetera. But I just thought it'd be interesting to make a mental note about the dadgad tuning and that. The dad gad tuning is it's not a standard tuning at all. Um, it's a, called dad gad because even though I'm capoed up, um, the low E string is now D. So D, A, D. I got three Ds. D, A, D, G, A, D, dad gad. And it's a very versatile tuning. Um, Pierre Ben Suzanne is probably the, the most uh, notable uh, user of the dad gad tuning, but a lot of Celtic Celtic -y guitar players use it because you can really get that um, kind of modal sound. Very fifty sounding, but it's also great tuning for bluesy stuff. So I love the dad guy tuning. I don't use it that much, but since I've been going on and on about drop D tuning as being my sort of go-to favorite, dad gad would be probably. Um, second or third on the list and this tune which i'm going to play for you which the lyrics are posted now if you want to get them and follow the bouncing ball um they're online this this tune is called blind indifference and i figured i'd play it because well the tone the tune is about uh tolerance and um empathy and uh kind of um I don't, well, it's it's about tolerance. It really is about tolerance. And um, I figured we could all use some of that in this day and age. It's pretty easy to get, to get uh, ticked off with the idiots who are continuing to be idiots. Um, you know, here on Vancouver Island, we're dealing with people who are, uh, you know, taking the Easter weekend and getting on ferries and coming over. It's like, what, what are you thinking? You're going to get on a ferry and come over to Vancouver Island to have your Easter weekend. You're going to go to some little community up island and, you know, take all the stock out of their grocery stores. People are, people are stupid sometimes. Anyway, tolerance, folks. So I'll play the tune and then I'll talk about it and the usual thing. Um, if you have questions, I will try and actually get to those questions. Hello, Seattle, checking in. 
Um, Clinton Anderson, I love me some dad gad. Dad gad is awesome. I think James Keelahan was the first one to show me dad gad. And apparently, dad gad, this tuning was brought to us care of the great Davy Graham, the British guitar player, who was he was a he was a pirate and he was a real uh innovator on the acoustic guitar back in the sort of the early days of the British folk scene. And Davy Graham. He was a maverick, and he uh, he took off and traveled around Europe back in the day when people weren't doing that. Probably, you know, before the, like the the early days of the '60s, when the real adventurers were the ones going to Turkey and Greece and places like that. And he uh, he went out with his sort of musical ears tuned and came back with this tuning, which would be open. It sounds like this. <laughs> quite a it's definitely eastern influence tuning and uh apparently it's it's not a it's definitely not a guitar tuning um a sort of standard guitar tuning but he was the one who adapted i don't know whether he got it from oud playing or where he got it but uh apparently he brought it back to england as a guitar tuning and was the real um the the one who made it really popular in that way and a lot of british stuff a lot of renborn and uh Bertie Hanch and, and a lot of those sort of some of their stuff would have been a dad gad thanks to Davy Graham. Okay, enough talking. Here's the song. <laughs> train tracks are unparalleled never shall they meet he and i are two sides of the same suburban street we share the same religion hum the same old song and we learn to keep our distance and we never get along oh mercy shine your love on me take this blind indifference make me see all the good around me all the friends that keep me clean human beings were never born to be so mean the cost of happiness is rising like the stink of gasoline Blowing down the highway from the trucks and the limousines. And the streets, the tempers, the V8 pistons fly. Curses flung like bottles at the endless path of life. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. Take this blind indifference and make me see all the good around me. All the friends that keep me clean Human beings were never born to be so mean About my father I've been thinking about his son I've been caught between what could have been and the things that we should have done mm, 
Sometimes I think the only thing that keeps you from someone is the pride you never lost and the respect that you never won. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. Take this blind indifference to make me see all the good around me. All the friends that keep me clean Human beings were never born to be so mean All oh, mercy, shine your love on me Take this blind deliverance and make me see All the good around me All the friends that keep me clean Human beings were never born to be so mean Human beings were never born to be so mean. The human beings were never born. The human beings were never born. Human beings were never born to be so mean. Blind Indifference. <laughs> Again, not the first song you want to play in your set, but um, there you go. I started the show tonight with Blind Indifference, and there was nowhere to go after that. Oh my God, this guitar sounds good through that mic. I hope I'm not blowing up your um, speakers, but um, sounds pretty good in here. I do love the dadgad tuning. I, I've written a couple of songs in it. Do you love your children? Do you treat them right? Kiss them good morning. Kiss them good night. I love that girl. I give her everything. And I'll never have her love But she gets everything I am It's just a great one. And you know why I love it so much is, apart from that 50 modally sound, is... You can play all the strings. You can get that that big bottom endy sound, which is what what I love about the acoustic guitar. And um, what John Martin's playing really got into my head was that the guitar is, of course, it's this lovely instrument that you can play. Of course, in a weird tuning. You can do that kind of arpeggiating, Paul Simony sort of uh, Travis picking thing, but you can also really lean into it, and 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 it, when you do, it rewards you with this percussive thing. And I I, I really I really love that so much. So that's off to John Martin. So. Blind indifference, pardon me for belching into my uh, microphone. <laughs> We're really getting to know each other now, aren't we? Um, blind indifference. There's a story that I tell about this song on stage, which you've probably heard. I kind of figure at um, episode three of Under the Hood, only the hardcores <laughs> remain. So you've probably heard um, these stories a million times but i'll tell it again because it's um you know it's it's there's some truth in it of course you know when you're on stage anything goes you can make up whatever the hell you want but um 
the story I tell is that, and and again, this, there is a lot of truth in this story. I, when I wrote this song, I was living in Guelph, Ontario, and uh, I was living beside the neighbor from hell in a row house. It was actually, the house was an old barn and it had been dragged from somewhere out in the country and um, put down in this spot in Guelph way back, probably a hundred so years ago and turned into three row houses. So it was an old post and bean barn that had been turned into houses and we were in the middle. So we had neighbors on either side and the neighbor on this side was the neighbor from hell. And honestly, I'm not exaggerating. I We had the cops come so many times and um, fire brigade, the whole lot, the gamut of social, you know, when, you, when you're pissed off at your neighbor, who are you going to call? And so the, to give you the best example, one particular Saturday afternoon, Oliver Schroer, my, my God love him, Oliver's gone from us now, but the tallest freestanding fiddler in Canada, Oliver Schroer, uh, beautiful gentleman and a very very sweet a very there was there wasn't a loud bone in that man's body he was subtle and um he was just a very kind empathetic human being and he taught a lot of kids how to play fiddle and uh he brought his music to all sorts of wonderful places um anyway oliver was in my front room and uh it was like, I don't know, four o'clock in the afternoon on a Saturday, sunny Saturday afternoon, and we were playing acoustically. So Oliver's playing his beautiful liquidy fiddle lines, and I was playing this here guitar, and suddenly there's, you know, on the front door, and two RCMP officers in full Kevlar, and the, you know, the cruisers out on the road, whoo, they didn't have the sirens on, but the lights were on. And uh, I opened the door, and this cop looks at me, and I've got my acoustic guitar in my hand. <laughs> and he looks at me and he goes, we've had a noise complaint. And I look at him and I look at my guitar and it's like, you know, the house is still, you can hear little birds chirping in the background. And, uh, and I said, well, I'm just, you know, we're just playing acoustic guitar. It's like four o'clock in the afternoon. And then the other cop who's behind him looks over his shoulder and goes, Hey, aren't you in Blackie and the Rodeo Kings? <laughs> and I think, yes, I am. But, you know, that was the kind of thing that went on between us and the neighbor from hell. So when they finally left, when they finally moved out, my ex and I went up into the attic of our uh, house because it was a three-story house. And we had a, a bottle of 12-year-old red breast that we were saving for a special occasion. And we opened that sucker up and we had tumblers of it. And we would look out the window at them loading their ratty our sticks of furniture out into the moving van and you know we um, toasted them with with glasses of whiskey and then it started to rain and it was you know that biblical sort of ontario uh summer rain that comes bucketing down out of the skies like cats and dogs and that was that was even better they were leaving and it was pouring on them and then it turned to hail I'm not making this up. This is true. It turned to hail and there they were, you know, slipping around in the mud. And there's literally, can you imagine on your moving day? And that was like, I don't know, July. And it starts hailing on you. And there's like hailstones that like golf balls. So I went from feeling very vindicated and slightly boozily toasting, you know, the great, the great one in the sky who would send, I was figuring a plague of locusts was coming down on them next, but and then I started feeling really badly for them because I was trying to imagine how awful it would feel to be going through that on your moving day. And that was the genesis of this song because I started to feel regret. These train truck tracks run parallel. Never shall they meet. You and I are two sides of the same suburban street. So the image that I'm trying to get across is another reminiscence um, uh, when I lived in Ireland, um, the north of Ireland, uh, I lived in the south, but in the north of Ireland, in Belfast, there was a thing called the Peace Wall. And it was this huge wall that was built to separate a Catholic and a, and a Protestant neighborhood that lived so close together. They were literally, um, there was a wall between them. But the weird thing is, is if you'd gone into one of their houses, um, you would have, they would have been exactly the same floor plan. They were pretty much exactly the same houses with different icons stuck on the wall. And it struck me as being so bizarre that these people 
had so much in common and and really what was what was keeping them apart was this artificial thing and the idea that they would actually live on almost the same street except there's a wall dividing them is like some kind of weird futuristic film um, but that indeed was what was you know what it was like up in Belfast so that's what I'm drawing at in that song is it, that that image is the idea of well the train tracks you know if you've ever looked at train tracks on the prairie they just sort of go into the vanishing point and they never actually meet of course if you go into a marshalling yard they do but that's beside the point um and, and the same idea of the, the neighborhood up in Belfast this sort of two solitudes and um that's how I felt with my neighbor like we were we were we we were I think we had shared the same religion and hummed the same old songs like we had so much in common and yet never ever would we get together it was just one of those things that you know a nice cup of tea was not going to solve uh, we shared the same religion we hummed the same old songs and we learned to keep our distance and we never get along so yeah you can imagine what it was like we had, we shared a front step so i'd be sitting out there in the morning with you know a cup of tea in my house coat smoking a cigarette as i did then and suddenly the door would open and this person would walk past me <laughs> awkward um so yeah we never got along we never did um sorry there's a very large truck outside I'm, the bottom end is awesome um Oh, mercy. So we're into the chorus now. That's verse one. We're into the chorus. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. Take this blind indifference and make me see. So the idea that, you know, I could actually take pleasure in watching somebody's misfortune made me realize that I was being a, a bit of an arse pick, but also um, that I really needed to have a look at my priorities because I was not being very good Zen Buddhist. Um, oh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I was actually, I had been practicing Tibetan Buddhism at that point for a little while. And uh, <laughs> I was trying to be, I was trying to practice Buddhism like a, like a Protestant, which is a real, <laughs> it's, there's a real contradiction there. So I would sit with my legs crossed, like I'm going to do this like a Protestant. And um, my Rinpoche, uh, bless his heart. I, this is a long time ago, but he took me aside at one point. He said, you know what you already have, you already have a meditation. It's called music. So go play music and see you later. And he, he, he set me free. Bless him. Cause I'd probably be still sitting there with my 57 year old knees cursing. Anyway, I was um, trying to practice my, my Buddhism and to, to sort of look at this kind of indifference, this kind of glee that we can take in, in other people's misfortune when they've maybe done us wrong or we think that they're Egypts. And, you know, you can quietly get a little chuckle out of watching somebody slipping around in the mud and dropping their couch into a into some um, pile of hailstones. So take this blind indifference and make me see all the good around me, all the friends that keep me clean. Human beings were never born to be so mean. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, the only thing that's worth mentioning in the verse, if you're into songwriting stuff, is the rhyme scheme. These train tracks run parallel. Never shall they meet. And you and I are two sides of the same suburban street. And we share the same religion. And we hum the same old songs. And we learn to keep our distance. And we never get along. So the first four, there's a rhyme in there. And then the second four, there's a rhyme in there. It changes. Oh, mercy, in the chorus. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. Not shine your light, shine your love on me. Take this blind indifference and make me see. So those two rhyme. All the good around me, all the friends that keep me clean. Human beings were never born to be so mean. So uh, the rhyme scheme pattern changes from verse one to the chorus one. But it does it is consistent from verse to verse and chorus to chorus. At this point, maybe it's a good idea to talk a little bit about the guitar part. I really did want, um, one of my paranoias as a songwriter, um, or rather as a performer, because after the songwriter's done his thing, the performer has to make sense of it, right? The performer steps in and goes, okay, so these are the new 10 songs I gotta work with. Why did you write 10 ballads, man? I can't do 10 ballads in one night. I got to come up with something groovy. You know, it's just me and the guitar and my voice and my long winded stories. I got to, 
I got to make the set list go like this. So I'm always on the lookout for an opportunity to write something with a groove. And uh, once I started writing this song, I realized the train tracks image was what really got me. In. And it, it really just grew from putting the guitar in a dad gad tuning and starting to mess with. There's that John Martin thing, sort of. Check it. It's a, it's a wonderful thing, the acoustic guitar. What you can get out of it is amazing. And uh, that muted palm thing with the strings like a snare on a, on a, on a snare drum skin, that's what it is. <laughs> So I wanted groove, and I also wanted something that was kind of angry, because even though the song is ostensibly about forgiveness and empathy, and you know being a good, um, being a good Canadian, I always think of this as a very Canadian song. I got all mad at these people because they were arseholes, and then I watched them going through something, some bad thing, and I felt badly, and I was sorry. That's that's Canadian right there. Um, but I wanted to, I wanted, I wanted. To write a kind of an angry song. I wanted a groove that was a little bit mean. So that's what that's what I came up with. And Dad Gad is really good for that. Um what else can I tell you about the, the guitar part? Hey, maybe you've got a question. Let me look. Oh, Meg Tennant loves Oliver Schrauer's music. Me too. I miss him. You know that when he was in hospital, I went to visit him. We had to be very careful because he was he was so sick he he was uh, basically susceptible to anything and everything. Um, but he recorded, I think, two records on a mini disc in his hospital room. Amazing guy. When you write a song on a particular guitar, do you tend to always prefer playing it on that guitar? Hmm. I guess so. Although I don't have that many guitars. Um, I got this one. And I'm not going to get into show and tell because it'll mean leaving um, you staring at Johnny Cash's arse again. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess so. It, there are certain songs that have a certain thing and that guitar does it. And that was the one that inspired it. But, you know, uh, Every Soul is a Sailor, a lot of those songs were written on a Telecaster, believe it or not. And, um, you know, I... I realized, well, I'm going to have to play these solo and I'm not going out with us, you know, doing a solo gig with a telly. So then they get brought over to this guitar. This guitar, this 30 year old Manzer is such a monster because it has so much width. It's like a widescreen guitar. It has this great bottom end. It has a really nice top end. Is very even and it takes a licking and keeps on ticking. There are some acoustic guitars, and my new Manzer currently is falling under this category that if you hit it too hard, it starts to distort, it breaks up. Um, and it's just this one was built so it was kind of overbuilt, so you can kind of lair up into it and it, and it, it will still respond. And as the years have gone by, it responds even to the subtler stuff more than it used to. The new one responds to the subtle stuff really well, but it's not so great about when you really dig in. And it's because the bottom end hasn't developed on it. So, yes, some guitars um, are, are more suited to some songs. Um, hi, Laurie Keith. Welcome. Uh, but, but, but Clinton Anderson, when writing lyrics, when writing lyrics first or music first? This one would have been lyric lyric driven because I went through a phase where, I mean, lyric writing is hard. It just is. It's it's of the two things. I th I think I think a lot of us are our music comes more easily. At least to me, it does. And I I would I would suggest that a lot of songwriters fall into that department or that category where music 
is more instinctual and lyric is more kind of from here up. Um, at least the initial feeling is from in the heart. It's, it's, it's a feeling, but then you have to articulate it. And the articulation is where your brain gets involved. And uh, yeah, you can just see them behind me there. The books. Once you start getting into that, it's a very delicate balance between uh, um, between head and heart. And um, you have to hold the two of them at the same time because uh, there are there are times when you think, okay, this is my rhyme scheme. I am thinking purely from like a like a like a, a cabinet maker kind of mentality. You know, I gotta make this corner happen again and then again and then again. I got this is the joint I'm using. this is how it's gonna go together. And if you get to the third corner and it doesn't work, and it won't work, and you can't get past that stumbling block. Um, the metaphor is falling apart here. But when you get to the second or third verse, and you've you you have to make a decision: Do I want to break this rule? Do I want to go back and unpick what I've already written because I've I've literally painted myself or written myself into a corner? Sometimes you have to go back and undo what you did and and kind of rejig it all so that when you get to the point where you were stuck, you can go through it. That's very intellectual. It's very head oriented. Um, when it comes to making a decision about that energy, that is really an emotional driven thing. And you are articulating it with your fingers, but it's a very emotional thing. The melody, the melody for me is, is much more of an emotional thing. I can't write music. Like I literally couldn't write the notes down or the chords down. I can't even write tab. So it's all a feeling it's all a, 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 a sonic emotional thing whereas i can write lyrics out <laughs> and i do use books so that's how it works more and more i am trying to elevate the music part and go there first and make the lyrics serve the melody because i believe now i used to think that the lyric was more important i think they're equally important but I think the melody is more important. And I think that we remember a good melody. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. Happy birthday to you somewhere over the rainbow. Those are all great melodies. And we remember them. Um, and the lyric almost comes as we remember the lyric because we remember the melody. Even when we were kids, we were taught the alphabet with a good melody. Da 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 do 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 do. That was a way uh, for us to remember our our um, our alphabet because we can remember melody because melody is more important. Melody is king. That's what I believe. So I try and start with the melodies now, or when I get a melody, I pay your attention to it. I record them on this wonderful device. You know, either la 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 or with the guitar going as well. And, and um, I try and store them up and come back to them and, and see what words fit in. And it's sometimes you're sitting there and you're singing gibberish words. And it's like the famous story of uh, Paul McCartney um, with yesterday. And apparently he sang scrambled eggs for quite a while until he came up with the word that had the right da 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 consonant vowel combination and then when you sing yesterday you go well what happened yesterday oh, I was a love song all my troubles seem so far away and the rhyme scheme leads you and the whole thing starts to go but it it comes from the melody um, best advice to the writers out there go get a copy of big magic I go on and on about this um, my friend in Holland, who I just sent it to, um, wrote to me and said, I'm halfway through it already. Um, my friend Heike, who is in, in uh, Edinburgh, I sent her a copy too. It's just a great book, you know. Um, writing is, by nature, kind of a solitary thing. Even if you're with another person, you're still in a sort of solitary place. And so it's great to have, um, if you need me to close the window, just text me, okay, or put it in the comments if the noise is too loud um it's great to have it's great to have a buddy with you when you're writing when you're stuck because we all get stuck it, it absolutely constantly 
Um, you can call it writer's block if you want to maybe give it more drama than it needs, but getting stuck is part of the deal. So how do you get out of it? And it's great to have thesauruses and rhyming dictionaries because you can go chase down a word for an hour. You can disappear into a thesaurus for an hour. No problem. And uh, it's fun. So go buy toys that are part of this game that you're playing called writing song uh, songs. Um, you don't necessarily have to just go buy guitars. You can go buy reference books and uh, books written by people who have, you know, gone ahead of you and uh, read about them. You know, immerse yourself in it. Take it seriously. Give it some dignity. Uh, if you can, <laughs> we're all making sourdough these days. So imagine your songwriting is like your starter culture. You need to feed it every day. A little bit of flour, a little bit of water. Put it back beside the stove to grow. And it will grow. Okay, next verse. The cost of happiness is rising. Speaking of sorrow. The, but the, the cost of happiness is rising like the stink of gasoline. I think I got that line first for this. And the whole thing was set. It was all going to be about cars and the rat race. The cost of happiness is rising like the stink of gasoline blowing down the highway from the trucks and the limousines, gasoline limousines. Trucks and limousines was wealthy and working class, you know, trying to get that image in, trying to cover all the bases. Um, and the smell, you know, I talk about show, um, show, don't tell. So, I mean, I'm telling you the cost of happiness is rising. That's definitely a tell. Things are getting hard. I'm trying to put images into it, but the stink of gasoline is definitely showing, not telling, because I'm trying to make you, we all know what that smell is. It's like the smell of a dock in the summer when the tar is coming off it. I love that smell. Um, blowing down the highway from the trucks and the limousines, in the streets, the tempers and the V8 pistons fly. Pistons, fists, fists flying. People hot get hot in the summer. They lose their tempers. They get um, they get hot blooded. They get short tempered. That's the idea I'm trying to get along. Being in a city where I think of London, Ontario, in the middle of the summer, but you know certain parts of certain cities downtown, it can get pretty gritty and hot, and um, people do stupid stuff and they get mad at each other, road rage, etc. In the streets, the tempers and the V8 pistons fly. Big cars, not, not little genteel cars. Big old rusty clunkers, land yachts. That's the kind of cars I'm after. Curses flung like bottles at the endless passerby. So imagine somebody in a big rusty clunker driving down the road just chucking beer bottles out and going, Fuck you! that's the kind of energy I'm trying to get into this verse. And then we go back to the, the chorus. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me, trying to appeal to my higher power, the, 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 uh, the power of mercy, you know. Give me some of that, not for me, but let me have some of that for other people, especially these Egypts outside my window who are trying to move their ratty furniture in a uh, summer monsoon, who I really dislike intensely, but... Give me some mercy for them, please. Um, let me look again for questions. A <laughs> comic. <laughs> I live with a comedian. Uh, I am. I am definitely um, in the the shallow end of the pool when it comes to comedy. Big magic, yes. Big magic, Elizabeth Gilbert. That's my advice to you. Um, I got I got caught in books like The Artist's Caught is the wrong word. I read books like The Artist's Way and Writing Down the Bones is another good one. I don't know where my copy of that one has gone, but those are kind of self-help books for writers that have at the end, you know, exercises. I found them boring as hell. And, you know, I fill notebooks full of, because one of the exercises they say is, okay, if you're stuck, get a pencil, sharpen it, and then write an endless stream of whatever comes into your head until the pencil is blunt or set your alarm clock for five minutes, your, your uh, timer on your phone. And the idea is that you can't take the pencil off the page and you can't stop it moving for five minutes. So you can write, 
I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. I don't know what to write. No, 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 no. Yes, no, yes, no. And you just keep writing. And, and the nice thing about writing by hand is it slows you down. So you keep writing these thoughts and following it. And it is really trying to prime the pump. But you'll end up with a notebook full of gibberish. And ultimately, I found that that wasn't helping me because I needed to dig down into that well a different way. And so I was looking for inspiration and uh, read books, read books by people that inspire you. It can be J.K. Rowling or it can be Agatha Christie or it can be uh, Guy Vanderhaeg. <laughs> Whatever you want, just read, take it seriously. That's the trick. Um, it's not like this is a big problem. Well, how big of a problem is it? Your, your uh, uh, drought of lyrics. How long have you actually spent not, not sitting with paper and um, going, I don't know what to do, but how long have you spent exercising the muscle of being a writer, reading, going for walks, observing what's around you, making note of it, paying attention to what people say, because people say the damnedest things. Uh, the the title Red Lights in the Rain came from overhearing somebody in a conversation. And that image just popped out and I wrote it down. And that's what you got to do. You got to take this stuff playfully, seriously. So uh, big magic is great because it's not a it's not a kind of a okay, you have a problem, do this. It's a this is fun. It's, 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 it's a very lighthearted look at writing um, or any creative thing you do. Last verse. And this verse is very interesting because this verse was actually the second verse. You know, they talk about going from the personal to the uh, personal to the to the everybody. <laughs> See? Well, a master of words you are, Mr. Fearing. Um, the, the, from the, the personal to the plural. Mm. Um, I've gone the other way with this song. It starts very much with you and me, and then it goes to the second verse is about all of us, you know, the city, the cost of happiness is, that's, that's everybody. And then it gets very personal. And the last verse is extremely personal. And it's about my dad. <laughs> my folks divorced when I was five, I think. So, you know, I didn't really have much of a relationship with my dad because we left Canada, as you'll know from The Longest Road, the first in this series of Under the Hoods. We left Canada roughly when I was six. And I didn't see him very much after that. And so I've had this real kind of, I don't know if love, hate is too strong a word. I don't think I ever hated my dad, but I was sure mad at him for a long period of time. I stopped being mad at him right about the point where I started doing things like getting divorced. And then I went, oh, okay, I understand. <laughs> not, you know, not to necessarily forgive in that way or you know go oh well you get it you know you get a you get a pass card but i understand i understand and uh this song is um this song and this verse is really grappling with that so i started by the first line is i've been thinking about my father and then the second one is i've been thinking about his son which is a nicer way of saying uh, than saying i've been thinking about me <laughs> <laughs> because I'm his son. He only had one. It was me. Um, caught between, and this is a nice, there's a nice little internal rhyme. Internal rhyme. Rhyme is is a da 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 So it's the last line in the song. Um, the cost of like the stink of gasoline from the trucks and the limousines. Those are two classic at the end of the line rhymes. But in this line, there's an internal rhyme caught between what could have been. And that's a nice internal rhyme. If you can make those things happen, they're great. And the old songwriters, the old, uh, the guys that wrote, um, mostly guys, but the, 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 the old ones, the, 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 the classic songwriting teams where one person wrote the melody and one person wrote the lyrics, they were full of internal rhymes and they are super playful. There is one book, if I could find it quickly. Yeah, this one. Sammy Khan. 
Sammy Khan's rhyming dictionary. Sammy Khan wrote, it would take more than the space available here just to list all his hits, but three coins in the fountain, uh, love and marriage, I'll walk alone, it's magic, the tender trap, come fly with me, come fly with me, we'll fly, let's fly away. Sammy Khan wrote the lyrics for those songs, and this book is his personal rhyming system. And he's very particular. He talks about, at the start of the book, at the start of the book, how to use this book, which is pretty great, the introduction. Um, and he, you know, his first sentence, I'm often asked which come first, the words and the music. It's a, it's a question that, that songwriters get asked a lot. His answer, I answer that what comes first is the phone call asking you to write the song, which is great. Because these guys, they wrote because it was it was definitely a livelihood. It was like making sausages, not in any way to belittle it, but it was like nine o'clock heading down to the office, you know, got to go and write songs. Not like the sort of the, the romantic, I'm a singer-songwriter, I sit in my mm. office late at night and write songs. No siree, it was time to pay the mortgage. And if you do go down this road as a living, you end up crossing that line between I'm doing this because I'm an artiste to I'm doing this because it pays my living. And sometimes you don't even know you crossed it. And you look back and, and somewhere way back in the back in the in your history is that the line and you crossed it. And now it is. You are tethered to it to make your living. So suddenly these guys start to make more sense. But his his method for rhyming things is very precious and it's very, very formal and it's very much um, there are perfect rhymes and there are imperfect rhymes. Gasoline, limousine, that's a good solid rhyme. Um, see and mean, no, that's not a rhyme. Not, not a Sammy Khan rhyme. He wouldn't accept that at all. And so he would keep writing and keep writing to find the correct, exact, perfect rhymes. Very interesting stuff if you like that stuff. But uh, the point I'm trying to make is it should be something that you play with. Anyway, back to my father. <laughs> Um, caught between what could have been and the things that we should have done. Well, yeah, you know, it's a bit like that Harry Chapin song. Um, the things that we should have done, fathers and sons. Oh, here's another one. Uh, we all know what they are, and we all know uh, how we, we lack, both as father and son, because uh, there's a point where I had my obligations to him and I failed him because I was pissed off at him, et cetera, et cetera. Sometimes, and this is where we get into it, sometimes I think the only thing that keeps you from someone, someone, I'm going to get to that word, that one still bugs me. Sometimes I think the only thing that keeps you from someone is the pride you never lost and the respect that you never won. I kept a couple of dubious lines in there because overall I really loved the spirit of those four lines, but I couldn't find a way to say it um, in, a, in a more concise, less clumsy way. And it is clumsy. Sometimes I think the only thing that keeps you from someone, my mother used to talk about putting the emphasis on the right syllable. So it's someone, not someone. Everybody says someone. It's a small thing, but I actually, I, um, I spend quite a bit of time weighing those. I think of it as a cheap budget, a, a B movie, right? Where the, the, the spaceship comes, sh comes through the picture like this. And you don't want to see the piece of string holding it up. You don't want to see the boom. You don't want to see this, right? This is the B movie where you see the microphone. You don't want to see that in a movie. It totally wrecks the idea that, you know, you're out um, in space with Captain uh, Marvel. Uh, you, you, want, you, you don't want anything that, that, that was the third wall it's called that, that takes you away from where you suddenly go, oh, wait a second, this is a dumb movie I'm watching. I can see the shaky cardboard spaceship. I can see the boom mic coming into the shot. 
and in lyrics in songwriting you don't want to make you don't want people to go wait a second i just heard a rhyme scheme happen i just saw a clumsy rhyme a clumsy line the really great songwriters the john prines of this world they just make that stuff just drift by you no 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 it's okay you're just hearing a conversation this isn't a song i didn't spend hours working on this no 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 it's just it just fell out whole and that's what the really great writers do they they make it sound like a conversation and that's what we're all trying to do so when you get sometimes i think the only thing that keeps you from someone it's a little clumsy but the next part is the payoff for me is the pride you never lost and the respect that you never won. That's pretty, to me, is pretty direct because it's exactly what I wanted to say. And it's mutual. Uh, the pride, he never lost and I never lost because my dad was a very proud man and uh, he couldn't get over himself to, uh, you know, do what he should have done as a dad. And, uh, and to be honest, I couldn't either get over myself to do what I should have done as a son. I did later. I was able to kind of bridge the gap, but boy, I had to, uh, I had to hold my nose <laughs> and the respect that you never won. I think both of us were um, looking for a little more respect, please. I certainly was. Um, I know there was a point where I played, uh, um, I played a Bach piece that I'd learned from a Leo Kotke recording. Da, 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 da. I, I learned how to play that on guitar. My father was a classical organist and classical pianist and taught music. And there are still musicians in Vancouver who come up to me to this day. And they're all a little bit older than me. And they say, I'm in music because of your father. He was a great teacher. So I thought that he'd be excited that I learned to play Bach on the goddamn acoustic guitar. And his, his response was, oh, no, that should only be played on the piano, which is like a bit of a buzzkill. But, you know, um, yeah, that's the way it goes with fathers and sons. I was really trying to get that energy in. And again, then we go back to the chorus. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. You know, let me not be so hard-hearted. Let me not be so judgmental. Let me not be so goddamn righteous. That's what I'm trying to get at. So there you have it. 1997. How many years is that ago? 20-something years ago. Um a lot of water into the bridge. I'm a little less angry than now than I was then. And uh, my father's been gone a decade. Bless him. I think about him lots. Um, I have pictures of him around the house. And I think about him when I play this song, but there's always a, this, there's this feeling. There's some songs, you know, people ask me, can I play this song or that song? Uh, well, for Wednesday's one, people want to hear. I can't play it anymore. I just can't climb into that coat anymore. It's it's so dark and I can't go there. I can't find the thing that I that allowed me to unlock the door and walk into that room over and over and over. But this song, man, I can get up to speed with this one pretty fast. And when I get to that last verse, it's amazing how I go back to feeling a lot of things, you know, um, Canadian, I should feel better about myself and forgive people and also still pissed off, still pissed off of the yahoos, you know, who are driving down the street and they're dirty old land yachts being idiots. And, uh, and my, my poor dad, <laughs> um, let me look for questions. Uh, will you, will I play it again? You want to hear it again? Was that? Sorry. What? Or some bluesy stuff. <laughs> uh, Sammy, how are you doing? Sammy Mesba. Sammy Mesba was, I think, the second website I ever had you created. Bless your heart. From an audience perspective, it's not clumsy. Okay. The emphasis works perfectly because of the emphasis works perfectly because of the delivery, the tone and weight of the music make it seem fitting. Okay, well, there you go. Um, as a songwriter, you know, you polish and polish and polish, and there is a point where you go, that's it. I got to leave this alone. Otherwise, I'm going to wreck it. Yeah. Um, Clinton, never change those clumsy lines. Personally, I treasure your lines. Okay, thanks. Uh, as you can see, I left it there, so that's good. Internal rhymes are evocative of the limerick. Yes, they are. 
and everybody loves limericks. Okay, here's one of my stepfather's limericks, the best one ever, because he had all sorts of usual, the usual body ones. You know, there was a young man from Madras whose balls were made of brass, and stormy weather they clanged together, and sparks came out of his ass. That was a classic of my stepfather's. But he also had this, he had one limerick that was like a, um, like a Dali, Salvador Dali limerick. So there was a young man from Dundee who got stung on the neck by a wasp. When asked, did it hurt? He said, no, it didn't. And it can do it again if it likes. I love that. The lesson in that for the songwriter is that the rhyme scheme is gone, but the meter, there was a young man from Dundee who was stung on the neck by a wasp. When asked, did it hurt? He said, no, it didn't. It could do it again if it likes. It still works. That's what I love about it. Okay. Huh. People are asking for so many miles next, please. Oh, but or dog on a chain. That's so funny. Those two are ones I'm thinking about. What songs would you like next? Okay. Uh, tip jar options. You know, I got my CERB. I'm doing okay. I think, well, yeah. If you want to, if you want to tip somebody, if you want to buy my records, great. If you want to tip somebody, there's a whole bunch of musicians out there who are hurting. I'm doing okay, but thanks. Um, this interaction is worth gold to me, and I'm, I'm, you know, I, you guys like it, great. Um, but I tell you what, um, there's only so much sourdough bread you can make and gardening, which I am doing in in droves, but. Okay, 4.58. Oh, closing in on the hour. A little more reverb. These train tracks run parallel And never shall they meet You and I are two sides of the same suburban street we share the same religion, we hum the same old songs, and we learn to keep our distance, and we never get along. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. Make this blind indifference and make me see all the good around me, all the friends that keep me clean. Human beings were never born to be so mean. The cost of happiness is rising like the stink of gasoline going down the highway from the trucks and the limousines. Yeah, the streets are tempers and the V8 pistons fly. Curses flung like bottles at the endless passerby. Oh, mercy, shine your love on me. Take this blind indifference and make me see all the good around me, all the friends that keep me clean. Human beings were never born to be so mean. About his son, 
Caught between what could have been and the things that we should have done. Sometimes I think the only thing that keeps you from someone is the pride you never lost and the respect that you never won. Oh, mercy, sign your love on me. Take this blind indifference and make me see all the good around me, all the friends that keep me clean. Human beings were never born to be so mean. Human beings were never born. Human beings were never born. Human beings were never born to be so mean. There you go. It's weird to play the same song twice in a row. <sighs> thanks so much. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Anything else I'm missing? Oh, oh, thank you. Um, Jennifer, who is on the other side of this wire, um, it was her birthday yesterday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. And dad get to you. Happy birthday, dear Jennifer. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Thanks, guys. Uh, the next one of these is going to be um Tuesday the 28th, which is a ways off. Um, I'm doing too much of this stuff, and I'm not doing enough sourdough baking, gardening, and going for walks. Um, and I'm going to, I, I'm still very committed to doing this, but I am going to move this under the hood thing to once every two weeks. But I have some really cool stuff coming down the pike um, with other people. So uh, there will be um, the 30-year cowpoke is coming up. And I'm working on another one, which I'm not going to tell you about. But it will involve another kind of really interesting storyteller and um, somebody who has created a very particularly fascinating instrument. So there's more to come. Um, stay in touch. I will, um, I will uh, post um, in all the usual places. Thanks for listening. Take care of yourselves. Um, be kind to your local grocers. Um, some <laughs> I'm amazed by the 18-year-olds who are suddenly frontline workers and essential workers, and they're you know they're dealing with all of us and with our masks on and our gloves and our crabby moods. So look after yourselves. Wash your hands. See you soon.